Hello, everyone. Welcome to World Space Week 2021 webinars presented by Art of Inquiry. My name is Maya Patterson. I'm 14 years old, and I've been taking astrobiology courses for about three years now. And I love in learning about the effect that space has on the human body because it's very interesting how, like, space affects our bodies like when we're in there for too long our brain gets squishy and like our eyes get all watery and i don't know it just interests me and before i get started i just have to go through some of the zoom etiquette so everyone knows how to participate in today's event so please keep your cameras off and keep your mics muted and please ask your questions through the chat do not repeat any questions do not use all caps do not use more than one emoticon and please be respectful, supported and behave professionally and no offending others or moving screens. And just another reminder that you can use a chat box for any questions and then we will ask them, we might interrupt or we'll just address them at the end. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Quinn. I will also be helping to host this. I'm 14 and I've been taking astrobiology classes under the art of inquiry for a while now. Um, but without any further ado, let's introduce our amazing speaker, Luke Steller. Uh, he is a science communicator and a PhD student at the Australian Center for Astrobiology at the University of New South Wales. His research focuses on understanding how life formed on Earth through studying ancient and modern hot springs. Outside of his research, he explores all things creative to limited results, including dancing and basket weaving. He's currently attempting to write a stand-up comedy show about science, which is really cool. Um, and I'll uh, let Luke take over now. Thank you so much, Quinn. Um, I just want to say I'm so excited to be here, part of a event that's run by the future astrobiologists, by you and Maya and all these other amazing young people from Art of Inquiry. Astrobiology is so exciting for me because it feels like such a new field, you know, like I know when I was your age, um, you know, 10 years ago, I was worried about you know, science has all been done before. Physicists know exactly what's happening in the world, except for, you know, a few sort of quantum things. Chemists know all the elements. What's left for us to, you know, discover? So really, um, astrobiology is this massive new frontier that um, we're just starting to understand. So it's cool seeing that there's people as young as you, so passionate about it, and um, really sort of like taking up the mantle and going forward with it. Because, yeah, it's a super exciting space to study. So what I'll do is I'll just share my screen, and then we can jump right into this so let's see how this is going to go and if i share cool are you guys seeing just a full presentation there is that working quinn uh yep yep fantastic amazing so before i begin i'd just like to do something that we do here in australia and that's called an acknowledgement of country so as hopefully a lot of you know that we've got a rich history of indigenous culture of aboriginal people here in australia and they've been in this country for over 100,000 years, so a massively long time. And they've been doing science for this whole time. They have an incredible understanding of astronomy and how all the stars work and intricate connections between all the different plants and animals and geology. And it's just incredible what they understand. So um, in Australia, what we do is that we pay our respects to the Gadigal people, which is like the Aboriginal country, which my land's on here today in Sydney. And I just want to really thank them for looking after this country for so long and letting me be a visitor here because it's, um, you know, it's their land at the end of the day. So that's just something we do in Australia. And I really wanted to just um, start off with that. And now we can dive straight into the origins of life, a geological perspective. So before I start as well, I'd like to acknowledge all of these amazing mentors of mine who helped me, you know, in the science I do today. As I'm sure a lot of you will know, there's that famous quote, you know, scientists were, were standing on the giants of, sorry, standing on the shoulders of um, giants when we talk about the mentors that came before us. And people like Martin Van Cranendong, Albert and Anna, my mentors here at UNSW, but also Dave Dima, Suda Rajamani, Kathy Campbell, Bruce and Tara, the, all these amazing scientists that helped me in what I do today. And I couldn't do what I do without them. So I really just want to acknowledge them and thank them for their, all their help. So really the first question um, that I'm sure all of you think about a lot is who cares about the origin of life? 
I'm sure everyone listening in thinks the origin of life is very fascinating because it can be linked back to, you know, astrobiology and all this other stuff. But when you talk to people outside of our field of astrobiology, a lot of people don't really understand why understanding the origin of life is important. But for me, there's a few main reasons why I'm really passionate about it. And the first one is that I think it's a fundamental question for humanity. I think us, you know, as humans have been sitting around for a long time now, thinking about, you know, where do we all come from? Oh, uh, okay, here we go. Is that back? Am I good? Yep. Yep, amazing. Thank you. Sorry about that. I think someone muted everyone and I was roped into that. Um, yeah, so I think origin of life is definitely a fundamental human inquiry, but it's also important for helping us to understand if we're alone in the universe. So I don't know if anyone's seen this kind of sketched up um, picture before, but it's for the Drake equation. And this was this amazing time, maybe 60 years ago, you know, a while ago now, a whole bunch of different scientists sat around together and asked themselves, you know, what's the probability if are we alone in the universe? So they sat around with some amazing astronomers and physicists, but also a dolphin trainer was there because he was thinking a lot about how we can communicate with other intelligent beings like dolphins. Um, Carl Sagan was there when he was super young, he was 25 years old and he was sitting in this room with all these other scientists. And they came up with really in a lunchtime, this equation. And this equation is trying to think about if we know how many stars there are in our galaxy, how many planets revolve around that, and we know how easy it is for life to form on there, we should be able to, you know, do a really simple calculation and understand the number of intelligent, you know, civilizations in our galaxy. But there's a really important um, factor in there, and it's that NE, and it's the number of planets that have the potential to support life. And we have to really figure out you know, what do you need to support life and not even to support life? What do you need for life to actually form? So that's what I'm really trying to figure out today when we talk about the origin of life. But more important, it may just get us one step closer to meeting that ET, which I think for me is personally super exciting. And the last one as well is there's potentially great spin-off products. As scientists, we're always trying to sell our research, you know, as a commercial value, which people can argue whether that's useful or not for the fundamental study of science. But in the day, we need to do science to understand the world around us and hopefully do better as a species. Um, we can talk about it a lot later, but there's some great examples of amazing spin-off um, things around hot springs. And there's a really great connection from hot springs to COVID and trying to get some of the ways that we test COVID. So um, there's amazing, um, you know, examples that are out there that we can talk about later in the questions if people are interested. But for me, I think that's some of the main reasons why we should care about answering that question. Like, you know, how did life form on Earth? So what is the origin of life? So really, it comes down to this fundamental question. How do you go from non-life to life? And this would have happened, you know, billions of years ago on the ancient Earth's surface. There would have been some event that made non-life, you know, a whole bunch of rocks and meteorites and water raining down into life. And whether you're one of those scientists that believes in the idea of panspermia, which is the theory that life could have arrived here from a meteorite from another planet, you still have to solve this question on the planet that that originated from. Even if you keep pushing back the problem of did life originate here or maybe it originated on Mars and then was delivered here or it could have originated outside our galaxy and was brought in by an intergalaxy meteorite or whatever you want to consider, there still needs to be that first original origin process. And that's really this question of converting non-life to life. And really, when you think about non-life, it's just about the environment. It's the stuff, if you think about the earth today, took away all life, what would you have? You'd have rocks, you'd have water, you'd have lightning, you'd have pools bubbling around, you'd have a big ocean. And how could you go from that to creating life? And that's really the question that's at the core of my research. So has anyone heard about these things called deep sea vents? Maybe you can raise your hands if you heard about them before. Um, to raise the hand chat or ask questions if you're interested. Shane's heard about them, which is great. And really, they're these amazing deep sea underwater volcanoes. 
So um, we've got a few pictures here which are amazing, and they have these tube worms living all around them. So there's worms, there's crabs, there's shrimp, there's all kinds of other stuff. And basically, they're taking the hot rocks um, underneath the Earth's surface, so there's all this magma and lava deep underneath the Earth's crust, and ocean water is cycling down, falling through the cracks into that water, getting heated up and coming back up to the surface. And this process can leach a lot of the minerals and a lot of the elements out of those rocks as the hot water comes up through them and can actually, you know, concentrate all of these elements. So you get this black smoke coming out the top because there's all of this, you know, sulfuric acid and iron and nickel and all these other elements leached out of the rocks below and delivered on the surface. And you have an entire ecosystem living off these, um, you know, chemicals coming up from below. So the interesting thing here is that the entire system is powered by chemistry. As we know, on the Earth's surface, you know, we have producers. So they're, you know, plants that take the sun's light and turn it into energy through photosynthesis. And then cows eat the plants. And then we, you know, if we choose, eat those cows. And the whole food chain starts off with producers from that, you know, initial sunlight. Down here in these vents, the producers are actually little tiny bacteria that live within those tube worms and they're getting all their energy from the chemicals released from these volcanoes. And the exciting thing to think about um, that I love the most about these vents is that if the sun, you know, suddenly turned off or if there was a big volcanic explosion on the Earth's surface and the entire Earth's surface was covered by ash and no sunlight could get in, kind of like what happened with the dinosaurs, we would all die out. There'd be no food on the surface of the um, earth, but deep in the ocean, these vents would still be kicking along. They would still be forming, um, you know, life as we know it. And they wouldn't even know that life had died out on the surface. So I think that's something really interesting to think about. But the question is, did life evolve here? Was this the place where life first formed on earth? Um, a lot of people think that could have happened because of these really nice chemical systems that are closely linked to life. But a lot of the research I'm doing, and especially research by Bruce Damer and Dave Deemer, who are scientists in America, they're actually trying to understand these systems and they think they may not be as good as forming life. There's a few reasons for that. So the first reason is that the seawater that surrounds these vents, they're actually too salty. So if you have too much salt in your system, it's hard to get, you know, cell membranes to form that can encapsulate your cells. It's hard to get RNA and DNA to form. Salt can really clog up your chemical systems. So when you try and make a lot of the, you know, ingredients you need for life in the lab, if you pour too much salt in there, the whole system, the whole chemical system grinds to a halt, it shuts down. So if we think if the oceans were salty, you know, 4 billion years ago when life formed, it's going to be really hard for life to form there. The next one is that these vents, they could be too dark. So we know that life formed the ability to turn sunlight into food really, really early on. Some of the oldest fossils we have in the world, which I'll talk about a bit later, they actually formed when, um, you know, three and a half billion years ago, and they're growing up towards the sunlight. We know that their oldest fossils on the planet were actually photosynthetic and growing up towards the sunlight. Not only that, we can trace back into the genetics. We can do genetic analysis and look at the converging different, you know, um, ways that we can metabolize and make food from across all species on Earth. And we can see photosynthesis would have been around three and a half billion years ago. So really early on in life's history, there would have been the process of photosynthesis. However, if life formed in these deep, deep vents, you know, kilometers underneath the Earth's surface, it will be very hard for it to adapt and grow and, you know, develop the process of photosynthesis without floating up to the surface away from its current food source, which is those volcanoes. So deep sea vents may be too dark for life on this planet to have formed. The other thing that's really important is that the um, deep sea vents could be too dilute in meteoritic organics. So when we talk about meteoritic organics, that's meteorites, you know, asteroids and comets falling down to the Earth's surface, and they can actually deliver all of these organics that have been cooked up um, as they're floating around space. We would have had lots of carbon in space um, just because carbon is produced by stars and it's everywhere. And as you have it really, really cold, so in the cold vacuum of space and bombard it with lots of UV radiation from our sun or other suns, 
you can actually turn that simple carbon into complex organic compounds. Now, there's no life involved in this. Life isn't forming these things. They're just randomly happening due to simple space chemistry. So when we get some of these meteorites that land on the Earth's surface, we can actually cut them open and dissolve all the organics out of them. And we see that there's actually lots of organic in there, including amino acids and sugars and carbohydrates and lipids and a lot of the things that are in our life today. So it's really interesting to note that you have all of these organics you need raining down from the Earth's surface. And if they can form on the actual surface and not be diluted away, you can concentrate up a lot of them. But you can imagine if you have this massive global ocean and all of these organics raining down into it, they'll be so dilute. It'll be like putting a single teaspoon of sugar into the entire ocean, you know, over a long period of time, you can never get enough organics concentrated to do anything meaningful out of life. So the final thing as well is that these vents lack complexity. When you think about a vent, it's one big volcano pushing up out of the ocean, going off into the dilute ocean all around it. So you have something really, really concentrated, and then it's slowly drifting out into something really, really dilute. And there's a single gradient there. There's a single change from really, really, really concentrated to really dilute. But maybe we need something more complex. Maybe we need lots of different vents next to each other, changing and you know, swapping information and swapping chemicals. And we don't really see that to a massive extent in these deep sea vents. Then then last, I just one more yeah, for a question yeah, here. Of course, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but from uh, Anthony or Anthony, uh, what makes black smoke hydrothermal vents different to uh, white smokers? Yeah, um, Anthony, that's a really great question there. So basically, a black smoker is, um, they call it on the axis and they call white smokers off axis. And I never really knew what they meant for a long time, but the axis to actually talk to is the axis of tectonic plate shifting where the most volcanic um, you know, energy is. So a black smoker, it's the most similar you can get to a volcano. So it's right underneath a magmatic source and it's bringing up all of the liquid in the magma up to the surface, all of the gases dissolved there and coming out. Now that magma has lots of sulfuric acid dissolved in it, which turns into SO2 gas. And there's lots of different iron and elements in there. And that's all coming out. So that's why it's so black. It's because of all that sulfur in there. So the black smokers are generally like really, really hot. Um, they, you know, can be up to 400 degrees Celsius because they're so deep in the ocean. It's all that pressure stopping that water from boiling. So it can be super critical temperatures. It's really, really hot water. And it's really, really acidic as well. All that sulfuric acid can make it a pH 2 or 3. So they're really, really acidic conditions. White smokers, they refer to them as off axes and they happen away from that source of magmatic um, chamber, the magmatic volcanic, um, you know, activity. And the way they're powered it's because of this process called serpentinization, which is a really um, interesting geochemical process where you have certain rocks like a rock called olivine, um, which is magnesium and silica and a few other things stuck together. And when water hits that rock, it actually produces an exothermic reaction. So it produces a whole bunch of methane gas and it can also produce um, heat. But it's not as hot as magma, but it can still be like, you know, 50 to 100 degrees Celsius. So from like a really warm bath all the way up to boiling on the Earth's surface. So those vents, um, they're a lot less um, hot, the more alkaline because they've got more, you know, um, methane in there and they can reduce some, you know, um, OH and, you know, sodium hydroxide and stuff as well. And the interesting thing is that it's producing all of this carbonate and all this silica. It's precipitating out all of these rocks. And that's what that white stuff is. It's all this carbonate coming out of it. So that's the main difference between black smokers and white smokers. Um, with white smokers, people think they may be more potentially, um, you know, the place where life could have formed, mainly because they're not as hot, they're not as acidic, and they've got all this nice methane coming out of it. Um, but from the research that Bruce and Dave were looking at, you know, those white smokers, even if they're less hot, they're still, um, you know, too salty, they're too dark, they don't have that concentration of meteoritic organics, and they don't really have the complexity that we see. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. And one thing that white smokers and black smokers both have, which can be a bit of an issue for chemistry, is that they're too wet, um, which may seem you know, super obvious, but what happens 
when we think about um, making biopolymers is that they require dehydration. So for some of you um, who have made slime before or you know, link lots of things together, it's this process of polymerization. And basically that's taking individual molecular units, so small little molecules, and you link one to the next one to the next one. And by doing that process, you can make long, long chains. So when you make slime you know, out of PVA or something like that, it's actually taking the long chains of glue and linking them together with borax. Um, so you're kind of making the chains less slippery, less able to move over each other. But that's a polymer, that's a long chain of molecules. So this process here called polymerization actually works when you can kick off hydrogen, um, two hydrogens and one oxygen or water. So the way that works is that you have your two molecules and on one molecule, it has an OH and the other molecule also has an OH. And what you can do is that you can remove an OH from one of them and a H from the other. So there's just one oxygen and they can link up across that oxygen band. And from doing that, you can remove OH and a H, which can be combined to make H2O. So you can kick water out of that system, link up between that oxygen and create a long chain. And that's how we make nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. That's how you can make proteins, which are long chains as well. And that's how you can make carbohydrates, which are also long chains. So all of these you know, molecules that are really important for life all require polymerization. They all require these long chains to form. But this is really hard to do underwater. You have all this water pushing down on it. It's really hard to kick off that water, that H2O, to make these long chains. So a lot of people, when they do experiments, um, you know, when they replicate these deep sea vents, they can't get these long chains of polymers to make. They can't make RNA or DNA or long chains of proteins in these replicated deep sea vents because they can never get that water to get kicked off. Um, so that's a problem with these vents. They're just too wet. So here's the question for everyone now. Does anyone have any ideas of what environments could give us the benefits of hydrothermal vents? but none of their limitations. So what's a place where we can have all of these nice organic minerals getting cooked up from below and brought to the surface without the limitations of being too wet and too dark and too salty and too dilute? Does anyone have any ideas of what that could be? Maybe drop it in the chat or if not, I can just keep on going. Um, oh, I got one there. A lake or a pond from Shane. Yep, so that's exactly right. They're, I like to think of them as spicy lakes, if you will, and they're hot springs. So a hot spring is just like a lake, you know, it's a pond on the surface of the water, but it brings up all of these minerals from below. And the way they work, it's quite similar to a deep sea vent. So there's a magma body underneath it, water from that lake or from the river trickles down underneath, gets heated up, and brought up to the surface and it brings all of those minerals and all of those elements up to the surface and deposits them off. So in these hot springs, oh, this is a great video that I filmed in New Zealand. And you can see from the hot springs, all that pressure underneath bringing up this water to the surface and that mound that's around it. Let's just go back and see that again. That mound that's around that hot spring, it's actually all of the dissolved rocks from below coming up and precipitating out. They're, just, they're um, solidifying back out of solution. And they form these mounds of all of that silica that gets deposited. Um, you also get bubbling mud pools like this kind of stuff. And you get these amazing things. So these are pictures I took up in Ladakh. So that's up in India. And there's amazing hot springs up there that are constantly spewing out all this hot water. that's rich in silica and lovely other elements like boron and nickel and chromium. Um, and what these things have, they have the geologies. They have those dissolved rocks coming up to the surface. They have evaporation. So there's no need to worry about the water problem. It's not that water pushing down on it. You can actually remove water. You can evaporate that water from the surface. And they also have sunlight. So you can have organisms growing there that can initially be using, you know, um, the chemicals brought up from below to start their chemical process, to start life forming, but it's easily to transition to, um, you know, a photosynthetic organism because there's that sunlight there that can already help it along and it can get energy from the chemistry and from the sunlight, which is a really good way for help it um, jump that step. 
And another thing that these hot springs have is they have complexity. So rather than a single volcano or a single white smoke underneath the ocean that's dissolving out into a dilute ocean, they have the ability to have all of these different little pools that are all mixing together. And these pools can be super, super different. So this is a picture I took with my supervisor, Martin, in New Zealand. And you can see it's just, you know, a 10 meters across this small little pool, looks kind of um, boring, pretty, you know, um, just like muddy little ponds. But if you go around and measure the pH and measure the salinity and measure the temperature of all these different pools, you'll see that it's incredibly complex. There's all these different pHs going on in there. And just to give you the example, just down here, these two pools that I've highlighted, there's a tiny little pool down the bottom and that was totally clear. It wasn't muddy at all. It was 5.5 pH, so it was slightly acidic, but it was pretty neutral, but it was 90 degrees Celsius. It was nearly boiling. It was so, so hot. And then just 10 centimeters down a little outflow channel, there was this pool that was only 45 degrees Celsius. It was a lot colder, but it was a pH of three. So it was very acidic. You know, that's kind of like lemon juice. So you can see here that there's this um, different complexity of all these different pools flowing down to this lake, which is a 2.5 pH, which is really acidic. And you can see there's this amazing amount of diversity there of all these pools being able to offer something different chemically. That's a lake there, it's 2.5 pH. So these hot springs are shaping new experiments. So originally Dave Deemer, who's this professor from the University of California, along with Suda Rajamani and Bruce Deemer, they went up to um, a place in Russia called Kamchatka Hot Springs, and Dave got their permission from the people who own those hot springs to pour a big glass of prebiotic soup into a hot spring. He poured all of these amino acids and lipids and this big kind of milky organic solution that would be that prebiotic soup into a hot spring to see what happens. And what he got was that he demonstrated that these hot springs can drive polymerization, that as that pool evaporates, as the water gets lifted off, you can actually remove that OH and all these individual building blocks in the hot spring can link together to form a long chain. When you look at it under a microscope as well, you see all of these circles forming and they're actually what we call lipid vesicles. So lipids are a type of molecule that at the right pH, they kind of act like soap and they can link up together to form nice sheets and they curl up to form balls. And they're very similar to what our cell membranes are made out of, which are called phospholipids. So we can show that in the right pH of a hot spring that aren't too salty, you can actually get phospholipids um, lipids that you know, would have been in these meteorites, they would have been produced from space and they live it onto earth, can actually form these little balls that start looking a lot like cells. And if you put RNA in that solution, the RNA can actually get encapsulated and stuck inside those lipid balls, which is starting to look a lot like life. So this is a picture of a very simple organism that has you know, a, a ribosome and a nucleus in there full of DNA, which is stained green with that red phospholipid um, ball all around it, which is very similar to what we're seeing in these hot springs. So we're not saying that we've made life in the hot springs. All we're saying is that it's very easy for simple chemical systems to start evolving that could eventually start looking like life. So that's something very interesting that we like about hot springs. But the question is, is where's the astro in all of this biology? It's very good to talk about, you know, life forming on earth and hot springs and bacteria, but how do we link that back into space? And well, our best way to link it back to space is right here in Columbia Hills on Mars in a place called Gustav Crater. So in Gustav Crater, they uh, made this amazing discovery. The Curiosity rover a couple of years ago now, um, one of its wheels got jammed up and it wasn't spinning properly and it was dragging its wheel behind it and making these nice kind of like dugout tracks in the um, sand around Mars. It was kind of limping along and everyone was really worried about that, but it actually was to their benefit because it pushed all the sand and dirt away and could actually show them what was underneath the dirt. And what they discovered were these like little white streaks behind it, which they went back and had a look. And you can see that it was full of all these knobbly little white rocks. In that bottom picture down there with the pink and the blue arrow, that's a rock that this rover has actually driven over and crushed. It's cracked it in two and it's exposed this night white um, area on it. Now, this top image here is from Columbia Hills and you can see it's these knobbly white rocks that are made out of silica. 
that people didn't think much of. They just thought, oh, here's a new rock we found on Mars. That's kind of exciting. But there were two people. There was Jack Farmer and Steve Ruff. Um, Steve Ruff's a professor at um, Arizona State University, and he's an expert in hot springs, but he's also working on um, these Mars rovers. And he saw these rocks and he was like, wow, that looks actually very, very similar to what I've been seeing in El Tadio hot springs, which is a hot springs in Chile, right here on Earth. And so he had this idea that what if these pebbly little rocks are actually preserved ancient hot springs. So they're not saying there's a hot spring already on Mars now. They're saying that, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of years ago, when Earth would have, sorry, when Mars would have had water on it and it would have had a very different environment, similar to the early Earth before we had life, maybe there were hot springs on that planet bubbling away. So we see these wrinkly rocks everywhere. These are pictures I took at Puga Hot Springs in Ladakh. So that's in the Himalayas. And you can see that it forms these kind of wrinkly like rocks everywhere you go. You see them everywhere. And the exciting thing about these rocks is that when you cut them open and look at them really close in a microscope, they're actually full of what we call microfossils. So it's all these little filaments, all these little balls, and they're actually the tombs, the little encapsulated microbes growing in that silica rock. And to this day, there's not a single rock from a hot spring that looks like that that we've cut open that doesn't have microbes in them. And some scientists think that actually these structures, so these kind of knobbly structures, only form when there's microbes present, because the microbes can create the structures that they can grow on and kind of form layers up over time. So this process is called a stromatolite because it's layers and layers of little bits of silica cemented in place by those bacteria microfossils, those bacteria and casings. And we think that that's a really good way to preserve this ancient life. So we really wanted to go back there and have another look because we thought if we can convince the perseverance team to take the rover back there, get some samples and bring them back to Earth, maybe we can cut them open and see these nice kind of, you know, like stromatolytic, yummy little structures growing, these nice little organic structures that would be clear evidence that life was growing in these hot springs millions of years ago on the ancient Earth surface, on ancient Mars surface, sorry. So we were one of the three final landing sites that um, NASA was thinking about. So you got Columbia Hills there, you got Jezero Crater, which we know that Perseverance is at now, and we have, oops, sorry, and we had the Midway Point as well. So we went forward, we went to the, um, you know, the landing site workshop, my supervisor was there and Bruce and Dave and all these people. And now we're saying, let's send Perseverance back there to look more at these structures. Now NASA didn't end up deciding to go there for a number of reasons. And the main one really was that they wanted to see something new. They'd already seen these rocks before. It was still, you know, not exactly 100% clear there were hot springs or not. People weren't sure if they would definitely be preserving these little microfossils. So they said, let's go somewhere new like Jezero Crater where we can drill down into those, you know, lake beds and get sediment samples with the core of the rocks around there, which will be a very different environment that I hadn't seen before. So that's what happened, but there's still a lot of great connections. So this is um, NASA scientists, so that's Ken Willifed and a few of the other, um, you know, people who are the instrument scientists for the Perseverance rover. So they're the scientists that's leading the team to understand how each of those instruments work, like the Mars cam and the drill bit. And we actually took them out into the Pilbara. So this is in the desert in Western Australia. That's my supervisor there, his bigger Kubra cap on, um, Martin Van Cranendonk. And I was there as well. And we're all hanging out and looking at ancient fossils on the early Earth's surface. So these fossils, three and a half billion years old, are actually fossils of life forming in a hot spring. So they were all really interested to figure out, well, if we had similar structures like that on Mars, you know, would we be able to find them? Would they be able to detect them? So they were imagining if the desert here was Mars, could the rover drive up there? Could we actually get the drill bit in there? How would it work? Is the rock tough enough to cut through? So we did a sort of an analog study of these Pilbara fossils in Western Australia to see if it would work. So just to recap it all, and I think we've got a bit of time left over to um, go through some lots of questions and stuff, because I know that's what Quinn asked for. He said lots of time for questions. So, you know, we have these vents, which are amazing. There's all of these, you know, incredible minerals and elements getting spewed up from below, and they're great to support life now, but it may not be suitable for life to start there. 
you know, the not dark, the too dark, sorry, there's not enough salt there. But instead, we have these hot springs and hot springs, you know, they can concentrate these meteoritic organics, they can evaporate water down so they can create these long polymers we need, they can, you know, create these little vesicle structures, and maybe they're really important for supporting origins of life on Earth. Because you can yeah, remove that water and create these long polymers. So hot springs are found with the oldest evidence of life on Earth, and NASA was really interested in those on, you know, in the Pilbara in Western Australia. And also, whoop, sorry, there's also potential for hot springs on Mars, these ancient hot springs on Mars that may be still preserved in the silica. So as you can see here, our understanding of how life formed on Earth, our understanding of what chemicals you need and what conditions and what environments would make life form on Earth is actually really important for trying to find life on Mars and understanding for a life in the universe. So with that, thank you so much. I'll leave you with a few pictures of some of my travels around mainly doing science, but also having fun activities when I'm not doing science as well in a lot of different exciting places. And um, yeah, let's open it up to questions. I'd love to chat about anything that you found interesting about my talk or just about astrobiology, what it's like doing research, what it's like being a student, anything like that, I'd love to chat about. So thank you. Anyone who has questions, you can put those in the chat. And while we wait, uh, while we wait for that, I have a question myself. Um, why aren't there hydrothermal vents on Mars now? Or not hydrothermal vents, but um, hot springs. Hot springs, yeah. Anymore. yeah. That's a really good question, Quinn. Um, and I think the two main reasons for that is that Firstly, Mars geologically has slowed down. You know, as we know, um, Mars would have been really volcanically active. We have the biggest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons, on Mars. So a long time ago, there would have been enough lava underneath coming up to the surface, and it would have been a very different environment. But now, Mars has actually cooled down because it's a bit smaller than Earth. It's actually cooled down, and a lot of those hot rocks underneath, those liquid rocks underneath Mars's crust, have actually solidified and stopped coming up to the surface. So the first point is that there's really no heat underneath Mars to create these hydrothermal vents or hot springs or volcanoes or anything like that. Um, the second thing as well is that Mars has lost a lot of its water. All of its water is actually boiled off as the atmosphere kind of went away. And it's now really only trapped in hydrated minerals or trapped in the icy poles on either side. So maybe if you had a hot spring around one of those icy poles, you could get some water melting and forming one of these systems, but it's just no volcanic activity and not enough water to see that. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. And when I tell this, um, you know, narrative, this story of my research to people, some people do think, oh, does that mean there's hot springs on Mars now? Um, which would have been exciting because life could have been living there. But we think that, you know, there's definitely not hot springs on Mars because the geology now couldn't support it, but there would have been them in the past. And we don't think life could be living in these current, you know, wrinkly little white rocks, but maybe it's a fossil. It's a good way to preserve life to see if there was life on Mars millions of years ago. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, Quinn. We yep. have a question in the chat from Shane. And they said, do you think we'll find life in the solar, in the solar system other than on Earth in our lifetimes? Oh, that's a really good question. Thanks, Shane. Um, obviously, I have no idea. You know, I think we'll all like to find life, but it'd be very hard to do it um, because at the moment, the ability for us to go and search these different planets is really small, you know? We've just got, you know, a handful of rovers on Mars that are the size of a car driving around. You can imagine if you have to explore the entire Earth with only five or six cars, you can't actually cover enough ground to really find anything interesting, really, you know? So um, we're doing a lot more to have, you know, satellites going around Mars so we can do lots of imaging and spectral stuff, um, but it's difficult. There was the really exciting announcement last year of the phosphine on Venus. I don't know, Myra or Quinn, did you guys hear about that at all? So there was this discovery where they were looking in the clouds of Venus, looking at all the gases around Venus, and they found this, element, this um, 
molecule called phosphine, which is a really weird form of reduced phosphorus, which is, you know, the mineral the element that you have in like a match head. It's really important in chemistry, but we only find it in planets that size. You only find it on planets like Earth or like Venus or Mars only when it's produced by biology. So on Earth, we never get phosphine at all, unless there's phosphorus reducing bacteria, there's bacteria growing in a really weird environment, like in a pig farm or in sewerage or in like a really weird lake somewhere um, overseas, you find this phosphine and it's always produced by biology. So when they found this on Venus, they weren't saying that we found life on Venus, but we we're finding chemicals that suggest that life might be there doing something interesting because we know even on Earth, non-life can't make this phosphine. So really, the more that we figure out about the universe, the more we look into our solar system, we may find life. Um, but again, it's probably going to be some interesting chemical system. It's not going to be something that we can talk to or, you know, play catch with or have it running around or anything like that. It's really just going to be something simple like a bit of slimy rock that can metabolize and grow and divide or something like that. So um, I want to get our hopes up for having a conversation with ET from our solar system anytime soon. But yeah, hopefully we can find some kind of life on another planet. That'll be really exciting. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. How did you know, like, when in your life did you realize that you wanted to study astrobiology and study um, the hot springs and the origin of life? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, honestly, a lot later in my life than both of you, you know, I, when I was growing up, I was really interested in doing stuff outdoors. I loved rock climbing. I loved hiking and all that kind of stuff. And I knew I wanted to study something that would let me be outside a lot, you know? And I actually, when I went to university, I studied environmental science and I was really interested in, you know, pollution and looking at groundwater and how our rivers are polluted. And I was doing lots of like, you know, environmental contamination research and that kind of stuff. But my supervisor, Martin, who was the guy with the big hat in that picture, he came along to me and he said, Luke, do you want to have the opportunity to spend a month in the desert helping me look at these fossils? And for me, it was just a fun holiday. I got to drive around on a big, you know, four-wheel drive um, for a month and look at all these different fossil sites and sleep out under the stars and have fires. It was this brilliant experience. But from that, I really got hooked on this exciting journey of trying to figure out how life formed on Earth. So it wasn't until I was really, you know, nearly finished my undergrad university degree until I actually knew that astrobiology existed and got into it. So um, I guess the interesting thing is that, you know, you never know where you're going to end up. But as long as you keep following your passion, you're going to, you know, always have fun. And I think that's the most important part about science is enjoying it. So, yeah. Um, and I'm really curious for Myron and Quinn, when did you know you wanted to do astrobiology? You said you've been doing these courses for years now. How did you get involved? I started taking classes. The first astrobiology was with Art of Inquiry. I think between, it, it's somewhere in the range of two, three, four years ago, somewhere in there. That's brilliant. And what made you want to first start it? Um, honestly, I think we just, um, my family just found the course and, um, uh, just started taking it. And as the, as Art of Inquiry expanded, just, we continued. That's incredible. Yeah. It's such an amazing process. What about yourself, Maya? How did you get involved? My story is a little similar to Quinn's because I'm in a program called BEAM. And they told me about Art of Inquiry. And I just like thought that it was really interesting, astrobiology. So I decided to join the course. And then after the first year, I just can like wanted to learn more. And I just continued doing the courses. That's awesome. <laughs> it's amazing how much you're both learning. You know, so young, you're not even at university yet. And you're doing all of this. It's such a good head start on um, all your research, whatever you want to do. So it's great. <laughs> And I think we have another question from Mariel, if I pronounced that right. Um, what is the probability of intelligent life forming? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, 
you know, people a lot smarter than me have been thinking about that. And at the beginning of my talk, we talked about the Drake equation, which is basically, you know, a whole string of numbers where you try and figure out how many planets are there in the galaxy, how many planets have life, how many of those planets have intelligent life, and you try and add all these numbers up to figure it out. Um, it's really interesting where, you know, just from an origin of life perspective, we have no idea how hard it is because we only have one planet where life formed, you know? And Earth could be very, very common for life to form. It could be very, very hard. We really have no idea how hard that process is. Um, we've only been able to look at other planets really in the last 20 years and only been able to look at, you know, a tiny amount, like only a couple thousand um, exoplanets. And that's like really, really basic identification. So we really don't know how hard it is for basic life to form. Um, there's also talk about things like the great filter. If anyone's heard about that process and basically, uh, I know Quinn probably has and Maya maybe. And this is really interesting process where is it actually hard for intelligent life to form, but easy for life to form? Maybe the bottleneck, maybe the hard kind of, you know, process that life has to get through before it becomes intelligent is after life to form. And maybe on all of these planets, you have basic life, you have little bits of bacteria growing, and maybe we'll find that in Mars in our lifetimes if we're lucky. So maybe it shows out that it's easy for life to form, but actually for life to become intelligent, for life to be able to grow and communicate and become multicellular and complex, maybe that's super difficult, you know? And um, an interesting way to think about that is that as humanity, there's been lots of things that could have totally wiped us out, you know? We've invented weapons of mass destruction, we've invented climate change. Maybe when you become intelligent, very quickly you end up wiping out your planet and maybe that could be the big filter event, the event stopping lots of intelligent life in the, soul, in the universe, you know? So um, you really don't know about intelligent life yet, but um, there's a massive community. There's people like myself understanding the origin of life. There's people who work at SETI who are trying to understand intelligent life and talk to them. So there's so many different people coming together. Hopefully one day we'll be able to figure it out. But yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. And if anybody has any other questions, you can toss those into the chat and we'll pick those up. And feel free as well. What I might do is put my email address in the chat and if anyone has any further questions they think about afterwards or want to know more about my research or get some send some papers or something like that you can just contact me and i can definitely answer them afterwards so that's my email address lstella at unsw.edu.au um definitely hit me up if anyone's keen to talk more about these hot springs and this research um yeah it's really good fun awesome And I find it interesting um, with the great filter, placing that in a specific spot to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, where are you going to put the filter? Yeah. Because it could be, like you said, where are you putting it? Where, mm. um, where is the barrier? So if, if you could place the filter wherever you want where would where do you think that barrier would be if there is a filter oh quinn that's a really good question um i think from a philosophical social answer i love i don't love i think it's really powerful to think of the filter as something that intelligent beings can do because i think it shows that we have this great responsibility you know now that we've evolved and that we're super um you know intelligent we can talk to ourselves and talk to people in you know other countries talk to robots and other planets we're expanding out it's now time for us to really look after ourselves and not wipe ourselves out so i think that's an interesting philosophical way to view it from a scientific perspective um probability wise i think multicellular organisms are really 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 hard to do and basically because they were kind of a chance i don't know how much people know about um the origins of multicellular you know biology but basically you had two different organisms this is the most current theory to make a eukaryote to, to make a cell that is what you know makes us up and you know is different to bacteria and different kind of slimy mats there's actually two separate cells two separate organisms and one ate the other one 
it was a, you know, an organism that's really good at producing food and an organism that's really good at swimming around and a food producing one was eaten by the other one. And rather than just, you know, getting consumed and getting, you know, dissolved in its stomach or whatever you want to call it, it actually kept producing food. And then the other organism that ate it kept feeding it little building blocks so it could keep making food. So that process allowed those cells to become a lot more complex because you had, you know, um, uh, uh, energy store inside that, you know, cell's body that could keep producing food for it. And um, to me, that's a massive fluke. The chance you can get something like that happening again is so unlikely. Um, so I think there's probably something in our, you know, evolutionary history to something um, like that. Yeah, definitely collaboration is definitely on a cellular level. Um, that's a really good point, Julia. But yeah, so that's definitely, I think, um, from a physical, chemical perspective, that's really difficult. But I think you're right, Quinn, that even with that idea of um, the filter being behind us, we still have a massive responsibility. What if we're the only intelligent life in the galaxy? If that's the case, we really have to look after ourselves and make sure we don't die out. So it could be our galaxy's one chance of, you know, painting art and telling people we love each other and all the great things that makes us human, you know? So, um, yeah, it's a really cool question. We can give a couple minutes um to make sure nobody else is going to post a question while we wait i'm really curious what the other talks were like this week what was your favorite one um maya or quinn Did i didn't catch... have a favorite they were all they were all they very were good. Good. okay <laughs> it's a very diplomatic they, they were all very good <laughs> amazing i, I actually... much really like the um the space aspect of or the, the astro aspect of astrobiology mm. because it would be terrifying but also amazing to talk to some random alien but yeah <laughs> unlikely as it is yeah yeah no totally maya were you going to say something I wasn't able to join any of the other talks because I was in school during the time and this was my first one, but I really enjoyed this one. Yeah, awesome. I'm happy, you know, um, you finally found a time for it to work. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Amazing. Um, but yeah, there's heaps of great resources out there. If anyone's actually interested, um, I have just finished building a online workshop, which is all around the origin of life and some of the stuff I've talked on with McMaster University. So we haven't launched it yet, but what I can do is give you the link to it. Sorry, just give me a sec. Um, and this is something that Ilan, which I think you've all know, she's been working on similar stuff with Art of Inquiry, has been helping out with as well. And basically there's all these workshops that we're trying to get people to be able to do science themselves and get involved with it. So at the moment, it's really just, we've got some workshops up there on um, more biology stuff. So we have one on endangered species and some bird species in Australia, as well as monitoring air pollution and making some graphs and doing some data processing with that. But um, within a few weeks time, we're going to launch one on the origin of life in these hot springs and all the chemistry behind that. So if anyone's interested to know more, check on that website in a few weeks time and um, you can, you know, learn a bit more about that. Um, I can also chat with Julia as well and send that in an email or something because it's free, it's exciting, and we just want people to have some fun with it. So, yeah. All right. Well, it looks like um, there haven't been any other questions, so we can probably wrap up. Uh, I just, thanks so much, Luke, for taking the time out of your day to uh, talk to everybody and uh, share a bunch of your knowledge. Uh, that was yeah. really amazing. And Thanks to Julia for organizing all this and inviting some of us students to host some of these webinars. Um, and thanks to everybody else who joined in and uh, listened in today. Mm. You know, thank you, Julia and Maya and Quinn. It's been so exciting to be involved in this whole process. Um, I'd love to do it again. So let me know if you ever want me to give a chat. Uh, maybe we can do some comedy next time as well, which could be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Luke. You're such an incredible speaker. It was such a delight. Thank oh, you thank so you. much. I'm just and very excited by it. So that's why I get <laughs> into it. <laughs> and thank you, Maya and Queen, for hosting the webinar.
it was very smooth and um, just mm. a pleasure. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.